This is a panel discussion that on some level began in the Chader Ochel where we just uh, sat with, uh, with our Israeli peers and heard from some of them. Um, I'm Shalom Berger. I take some of the responsibility for what's been going on here today. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking about education and specifically Tanakh education in Chutz Aretz first. I would say America, but I know we have some uh, representatives from Australia here as well. So, South and South Africa, okay, from and the New Southern Jersey. Hemisphere. And New <laughs> so, um, I, I imagine that many of the uh, challenges that exist in the uh, North America exist elsewhere in, in the Gola. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Gita Neufeld. Gita Neufeld heads the Allegra Franco School of Educational Leadership. Did I get it right? Yeah. Uh, in Brooklyn. And uh, quite, a few, quite a few of the people who are here are, are her students. Um, she heads, she, she uh, really is one of the people who initiated a program between Herzog and, um, and her Teachers Training Institute is the kind of thing that Herzog is looking to do more and more. Uh, for those of you who perhaps are in other settings where you'd like to create such, uh, such partnerships. Um, I asked Gita to say a few words about uh, the current state of Tanakh education as she sees it in, in, uh, in uh, the working with teachers in Brooklyn. Um, deal. And deal. <laughs> uh, Dr. Rabbi Dr. Barry Kisselwitz on my right uh, for many years was the principal of uh, Fuchs Mizrahi School in Cleveland. He met Aliyah two years ago, <coughs> has been working in Matach, and uh, this coming year he'll be heading up the master's program in educational um, educational administration. administration here at Herzog College. And um, he sort of like is in between. He's, he only recently made Aliyah. Rabbi Yehuda Trapper, who I first met in uh, Camp Mosheva in the United States many years ago, uh, today is the national supervisor for Bible instruction in the religious school system uh, here in Israel. And he's a lecturer in Bible and Pedagogy in Sha'anan College. And um, he probably has a sense of what's going on in Israel and uh, we'll be able to talk about how that might be able to impact on uh, teachers in Chutz Laaretz as well. Gita. Yeah. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have to give me that hand. Sorry. I need the other mic too. It's hard being a movie star. OK, so welcome, everybody. I am so excited to be here. I'm here with a group of wonderful people. And the wonderful people, I hope, are part of the solution to some of the problems that we're going to be addressing today. Um, Shalom asked me, what are the challenges of being a Tanakh teacher in Chutz Laaretz? And after I dealt with salary, respect, um, and all that, it got serious. And I was thinking that we could really divide these challenges into three locuses of issues. One is the students, one is the schools, and what the school community, and one is the teachers themselves. And some of these things you may have heard at the lunch. In terms of the students, um, when, I, when I polled a few teachers about this, I actually spoke to, over the last month, I must have spoken to about 40 teachers and said to them, what's the greatest challenge that your students face in learning Tanakh? Of the about 40 teachers, 38 of them said they don't speak Hebrew. It's a major issue. Even the schools which allegedly teach Ivrit the Ivrit, I invite you in many of these schools to take a walk down the hallway with the principal. And as you're walking down the hall, you hear, so Abraham said to Sarah, Hashem promised me that we will have children. And then as the principal's kippah passes the door, the azua marla, and then as he passes the door on the other side, and then they had Yitzchak. The, it's, the teachers are not teaching in Hebrew. Part of it is that teachers themselves are thinking in English, which is an issue in terms of our teacher preparation. How do I get teachers to stop? They're not doing it as bad as the kids. Hashem said, Hashem, Amar, Le, Tu. Uh, they're not doing that, but they're still really thinking in English. And part of that, I think, is the responsibility of the teacher training programs to ensure that teachers have a level of fluency in Hebrew and that they also have a content area of vocabulary in Hebrew. So that's one thing. So students are not speaking Hebrew. Then, Torah is not written in Hebrew. It's written in Lashon HaKodesh. 
and I'm going to pick on my, my son-in-law because he's not here to defend himself, and I'm a mother-in-law. My children lived in Israel for about four or five years after they were married. My daughter, thank God, has native fluency in Hebrew. My son-in-law, great guy, really great guy. Okay, his, he went to yeshiva all his life. He went to black, what we call the black hat yeshiva. He was learning in kolel in the mirror. And my daughter was working in a lawyer's office where she was the only English speaker in the office. Okay? And Suri had laryngitis one day. So my son-in-law says, I'm going to call the office and tell them that you're not okay. And she goes, you don't speak Hebrew that well. He goes, Suri, I learned Chumash. I learned Navi. I learned Gemara. I can do this. And he picks up the phone and he says, Kan Baruch Ber Bender, Ishti Choyla Ad Ma'od. Okay, she came back and they were like, what language does your husband speak? <laughs> okay, but we, we mix up Ivrit and Tzvat HaTanach. Okay, walk around and ask anybody if they've seen your Tzayet Tzayim. Okay, you're in trouble. But that's, so that's a second level. Even if children have fluency in Ivrit, they may not have fluency in Lashon HaTanach and vice versa. If they have fluency in Lashon HaTanach, they're not really learning Hebrew. And we, we, tend to, we tend to confuse our kids with that. Bigger issue that I saw, although I was a little disappointed that not that many people felt that, was both the relevance and the reality of the material that's being taught. Who really cares about concubines? Well, my second grade grandson does because he's learning about a Pelegish. Okay, but wh where does that come to my everyday life? When Yeshayahu is running around threatening a korban, you know what? We got punished. What, what does that have to do with me now? He can't destroy another Beit HaMigash because we don't have one. So where is the relevance of what we are teaching to our students? How do we make that real? Or is it just something that, okay, you know, from 9 to 12 I have to think about this, and at 12.30 when we switch to general studies, that's the real world. As well as the reality of it. Our kids, here in Israel, I can, think about... All, think about the Hayyim Shamoa. Okay, what's the key part of the Hayyim Shamoa? If you listen, there will be rain. In New York, we hate the rain. Okay, rain is really disruptive. Rain bothers me. My hair frizzes. I can't go. I can't go outside. Here, no matter who you are, when that first rain comes, hopefully in Cheshvan, everybody rejoices because in this country, you understand your 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 dependence and your reliance upon the rain. So how do I make these Middle Eastern ancient history concepts real to my students? I just mentioned Pelegish, but even a well. Okay, Rivka, she doesn't have to be three years old when she's doing this, but when she's running back and forth to bring water to Eved Avraham, what does that mean? How do I make that real to my students? Have you ever seen how much a camel drinks? Have you ever tried schlepping that amount of water yourselves? How do I make these basic concrete concepts real? And then how do I make some of the higher level concepts real? We ask eight-year-olds to talk about monotheistic belief. Right? Echad Abraham, he only believes in Hashem. What in, in, is that developmentally, how real is that to these children? Okay, I, I used to have a housekeeper who was like, why are you teaching them all these crazy things that this, this old man who didn't have kids and he wanted to kill his son and then God told him, kill your son, don't kill your son. When you look at it from the outside, we really are very crazy people. And it's very scary and we need to see, how do I make that real and relevant in today's, in, to, to today's children? In general, the culture, because then we have, I'm sure Yehuda is going to talk about this, we do have wonderful materials that come from Israel, but how real are they to our students? Our kids don't know what going to B'nai Akiva means. They, you say Shevet. If you, if you were to say to an Israeli child Shevet, what's their first reaction? B'nai Akiva. It's a whole different thing than oh, the Shvatim of, Abraham, of, of Yaakov. So making those things Crossing the cultural, the modern day cultural divide is another issue. I don't want to depress you, but these are things that I think are impacting upon our ability to impact upon our students. When it comes to the school and the community, time. How much time does the, does the Kodesh teacher have to teach as opposed to the general studies teacher? I once had a long conversation with an educator here. And I said, we're not achieving enough in Chumash. He says, so don't teach so much Cheshbon. 
Well, first of all, I have two different teachers. It's not the same teacher from nine to three. So it's not like I could even make that independent decision. Today I'm going to teach more Chumash and tomorrow I'll teach more Cheshbon. I, I, each teacher has their own allotted time. How much time does the school allow to these, to these teachers to teach? When you get into the older grades, sometimes there's less of an emphasis on Tanakh. Um, we've had conversations about like the role of Talmud, how much does that impact when you teach Talmud on, on, on the amount of Tanakh that you can learn. But in general, the, the increasing demands with the diminishing amount of time that is allowed for what we call in America, Lumud Kodesh. Um, the tools that teachers have. Walking into a school and you see these gorgeous math curricula, social studies curriculum, science curriculum, and here's your Chumash materials. Oh, these are colors. This is too modern. Here's your Chumash materials. Okay, they really don't have access. Many of our teachers don't have access to that type of materials, and that's why this morning was so gratifying because we had all these different things that are available for teachers to make use of, and, and I encourage everybody to share them. Te teaching is the only profession where it's okay to steal. Okay, just put the person's name on the bottom. Okay, and then you also have, you know, what is, you have parents that say, what is, who cares if my kid learns another two prakim? I want him to get into Harvard. And for that, he needs to take AP Calculus, not AP Torah, so that you have that pressure as well. And finally, in terms of teachers, how are teachers prepared to teach? Years ago, I'm, I'm, I'm older than I look, please tell me yes. Um, thank you. Um, but I, my, my teachers, when I went to yeshiva, were Holocaust survivors who knew how to read Hebrew. They were not prepared to be teachers. They just couldn't do anything else. Thank God we've passed that stage. But are we still expecting the same level of competence and of preparation of a Chumash teacher that we expect of a math teacher, a science teacher, a social studies teacher, an art teacher? And we all know, we can look at ourselves and we all know the answer, although we're all wonderful people because we've chosen to do this. But I'm just saying that in terms of preparation, formal preparation, formal understanding, dealing with issues like these little children learning things which may be in the general world and not developmentally appropriate for them. And the other challenge, which I didn't say in terms of, te you know, the kids know the end of the story. When Yosef gets thrown into that pit, it happens every year. It happened in Parasha, they acted it out. They, you know, so, so we have that, that issue of not a spiraling curriculum, but a repetitive curriculum. And one more thing, that teachers tend to feel isolated. Um, you know, if you are, how many people here teach in the department, as opposed to, you know, that you're the only teacher of that grade or that level or that topic? We have one department. Three. Three depart we have three departments, which means that each one of you is an island. Each one of you is an island. And it's very difficult if you want to throw something at somebody else and get an idea, we have that sense of isolation. So not to get depressed, day school enrollment is higher and higher every year. Um, people actually still want to be teachers. So it means we're doing something right, but there are definitely issues which need to be addressed. So as always, we turn to Israel for the solution. Zero, Kimi Etio. Okay, Barry. Barry Kislowitz. I introduced him before. Okay, so we did set it up so Gita just asked all the questions, and I'm just going to answer them all now. So if you, you might want to take notes. And I won't um, add anything. So. <laughs> he's going to translate to Hebrew. Um, no, it, it, they really are a series of significant and many of them endemic challenges to what we do. Not the sort of challenges that often can be solved, but the sort of challenges with which you have to contend. Um, and I think at least, uh, I'll speak as someone who worked for many years in the North American environment, in an English-speaking environment, and then made the transition to Israel. Um, and, and on that note, start with a story of one of the first times we were here with my children as we made Aliyah. And we were told that Ir David was a wonderful place to visit. Before we made Aliyah, I hadn't been to Israel in about 15 years other than coming to interview Shlichim. And when I came to interview Shlichim, I really got to see the inside of the Ramada lobby wonderfully. Other than that, maybe I caught a minion on Shabbos and saw a friend. I certainly wasn't going touring in the Yeratika. 
And so all of Ir David had not been uncovered. It was the Givati parking lot and other such mounds of dirt when I had last been here. And we went on this tour. Um, I'm going with my four kids who ranged in age then, uh, the full range of uh, lower school. And in the middle of the tour, my oldest looks at me and just says, this stuff really happened. And he was like shocked. And I looked at him, I said, it, it did. And in eight years of you attending the school that I can't even blame someone else for because I was your principal, <laughs> you did not get that message of this really happened. You, you learned the stories, they were beautiful fables, we talked about them every week. Um, you could even read them and translate them, but that first primary level of this actually happened uh, is something that we take for granted in Israel and is part of every kid's experience in a Mamakti Dasi school where my daughter finished Chumash Breshit in Kita Aleph and went to Marat HaMachpelah. So just that as an assumption gives you an entirely different plane based on which you're building. And so the question is, when we look outside of Israel, what do we do? It's impossible to replicate it as natives. Just as when you're learning a second language, you can achieve native proficiency, and we'll get a little bit more to language in a minute, but you won't be a native. You won't be born here. My Hebrew may be wonderful. I will not know the stories that were taught to four-year-olds. And when there's some reference to a TV show from the 80s in Israel, I've got growing pains. I've got who's the boss. I do not have whatever TV show was famous in Israel in the 1980s. And that's not something that I'm ever going to get, but we can get close. And the first step in getting close, as always, is awareness. It's understanding that even as teachers, we often teach this as lore, as history, as tradition. And those are all wonderful, positive words, but they're not today, my life, my present. They're not as real as the news I see on TV and everything around me. Thankfully, and I know that you saw some of these this morning, there are techniques, technologies, things that we can do to move towards that goal. Again, the first step is setting it as a goal. And then if we take our children on a virtual tour of some of the places in Tanakh that we're learning, often the ones that are made even not 100% professionally, but the camera's jiggling a little bit and it really feels like you're walking around the place. When we are able to give them that kind of encounter, when we're able to make use of things like school twinning programs and others, so they're speaking on some level, again, in a developmentally appropriate manner to Israeli students and hearing this is what I experienced. And the Israeli kids in Kita Aleph are writing about their trip to Marat Machpelah when the kids in Cleveland are getting their chumash from their principal in the school auditorium. But they're comparing experiences. They're learning about it. Um, and looking to bring that real life quality in is one major piece that I think can really increase the ability that we're able to, to make Tanakh a relevant part of our children's lives. The next piece I think really <coughs> hits the Hebrew. And there again, it is true that modern Hebrew is different than Chumash. But I also know that my second grade daughter now, who made Aliyah in first grade and so speaks Hebrew way better than I do, um, can read Chumash more fluently than my ninth grade son, who is in Cleveland until seventh grade. Because it's different, but it's the same. There's, a, there's the same basis, there's the same letters, there's the same vowels, and so it's you know, it's like teaching someone who speaks English Shakespeare as opposed to teaching somebody who speaks Hebrew Shakespeare. Um, how do we look towards that? So again, we have to be aware of it. We also have a tremendous amount of knowledge and research done in second language acquisition. Unfortunately, we don't do that well enough outside of Israel, even in modern Hebrew. But we don't do it at all on any level in Chumash. For the last two years, I've been working at Matach, which is a curriculum producing agency in Tel Aviv that creates a lot of Hebrew second language curricula. And I've seen and been part of the teacher training and the school training on what it means to really create the right environment, to have the right pedagogies, to understand how the brain learns language at different ages, and then to take that and apply it. Humash is not expressive language, it's not verbal language. So of the four sectors of language learning, it only hits one, written and receptive. So 
our job should be about 75% easier. Not really. But we can focus on that piece and teach them the language rather than just translating by Yomer, he said. Right? Who am I? Right. Whatever translation is translation. And part of best practices now in language learning is that anything that involves translation will not move you forward. You are always going to be using a crutch. And so, you know, if anybody's publishing Hebrew curricula now that somebody's using in their high school that have you translate from English to Hebrew and Hebrew to English, just be aware that's always going to teach the kids how to translate. It's never going to teach them how to speak the language or directly understand the language. But these techniques do exist. They exist in second language learning. And on a related note, they exist in terms of literacy. Now, I know the kind of techniques that we used in Cleveland to teach English reading to our first, second, third, fourth graders. They were much more advanced many times than the techniques we were using to teach Hebrew reading and certainly Chumash reading. We're not just teaching Chumash. We're teaching a second language and we're teaching literacy from its most basic levels. And again, this is a tall order. We are not all experts in second language pedagogy. We're not all experts in literacy. But often just being aware that that's what we're doing and we're not saying memorize what these psukim mean or in whatever chavayati experiential nice way that we add some you know, decorations around that, we need to think about the core pedagogy of what we're doing and learn what we can from the expertise that's been developed over the years in these fields. The last thing I'll touch on um, is again something that was mentioned before in terms of well, we don't have that much time, and there is a general studies side. I had the privilege of working in a school where Bishita, we only had principals who supervised both general and Judaics, because we viewed it holistically, and we wanted that principal who had a Judaic background to be the one making all the overarching educational decisions. I realize not every school benefits from that, if you are in a school that does, that's wonderful. And if you're in a school that doesn't, there still is that 50% of the day. And often, what we can achieve um, is what John Dewey referred to as the experience is the education. So rather than limiting Chumash to the classroom, I would challenge us all to think about how Chumash can fill our schools in little ways, hallway decorations, announcements, celebrating days, and so on, and in big ways, developing a Chumash lab that parallels our science lab, or those schools who are very innovative have maker spaces, but have a maker space that's focused on Chumash topics. But in other words, to say to the kids, Chumash isn't something we learn in class. When you walk into our school, you're walking into, on some level, Olam HaTanach of today. And that circles back to the original point, which is how do we make Tanakh relevant? We cannot create Israel outside of this land, but we can create a mini Israel in our schools. And if we focus on creating that holistic environment, while at the same time bringing in the best pedagogy that we have to offer, we, I believe that we can take our Tanakh teaching and learning really to a new level. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Um, I want to use the uh, Metzeget, so... Okay. I'll, I'll so then why should probably move? What? I'm using the Metzeget. I'm using the My English is so poor, so I had to prepare <laughs> something to help me. You want me to stay on the last chair and hold this up for you? Um, no, it won't work. Um, Yes, yeah, so Rabbi Huda Trapper, who is, who's, uh, although he denies that he speaks an outstanding English, uh, in fact, will regale us with, uh, with his, probably his first language. Yeah? It, it is my first language, but not anymore. Okay, I'll do and, that. Uh, yeah, I, I'll move over there. Yeah. Okay. You want maybe to turn off the light? The light is on? Okay. Um, yeah. Just a moment. This, is this uh, okay? Good afternoon. Uh, I'm happy to be here with you, American uh, teachers, teachers from other places in the world. Uh, uh, I had to prepare a lot to this uh, discussion because of the English. I was born in New York. I was nine months old when my parents made Aliyah. 
I grew up in Yerushalayim, and uh, I was back in Cleveland for three years on Shlichut, uh, a bit before Rabbi Barry was there, uh, late 90s. Um, so uh, I know something about American uh, Jewry, not a lot. I've been back a lot, met for many times in Camp Moshava, where I met uh, Rav Shalom for the first time. Just in Moshava, my uh, job was Nagarut, right? I wasn't a teacher there. I was Rosh Nagarut. That was my job many years. Uh, I taught also, I was a Val Kore there, but uh, that was my job. I loved it very much. Anyway, back here to education. Um, uh, uh, Gita and Rabbi Barry, they spoke about uh, different issues that have to do with language. I won't discuss the issue of language because I'm not into it. Uh, I teach Israelis Tanakh, which is a very similar language, although it's not identical. But I want to deal basically with one uh, big issue, and that is the relevance of Tanakh to our life today. Now, when we talk about teaching objectives, we usually talk about three things, about the content, about skills, and about values, internalization, or other ways to describe it. So I want to leave aside the issue of the content, to leave aside the issue of skills, and to discuss hafnama. That's our, the word I like in Hebrew, to internalize uh, different issues. And relating to that, the big question is, how do we do that? How do we make Tanakh relevant? Uh, one issue which came up here was the question of, it's in Chutzlar, it's not here in Israel, it's far away from the land of the Tanakh. That's true. But I think that Tanakh has something to do with our lives no matter where we are and when we are in history. Uh, the values of Tanakh are internal, although the words are ancient. Uh, and the big question is how do we turn the, uh, how do we help ourselves first of all and then our students to uh, create a relationship between them and the values of the Tanakh. Relating to that, I want to deal with a few things, which each and every one of them is worth an hour and a half, but I'll just say them shortly uh, to give you a certain direction, which I believe is, uh, uh, is very important. First thing is what we call Yeda Matzmiya Chinuch, knowledge generates education. Um, we cannot leave aside the knowledge when we want to deal with education. I think that uh, telling ourselves, well, our students will go to camp in the summer, it's a very educational camp. Uh, there they'll uh, get education, in school they will learn. This uh, separation between education and knowledge, I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a terrible educational mistake. Camp is great for many things that have to do with education, but Tanakh is, should be the basis of education. So that's one important thing. Second thing is, uh, um, this is a, a mashal I like. It has to do with the tears of my youngest son. Three years ago, we bought him a small uh, toy, uh, not from Toys R Us, that's already closing down, I understand, but from what's called Melech HaShekel, okay? If you met those stores of Melech HaShekel, uh, it's, everything is one shekel and it's worth, you, you get what you pay for, okay? So we, we, we bought him a small um, a car, and it broke after a few minutes. Big surprise. Uh, so he came over to me crying, Abba, please stick it together. Put these pieces together. So I told him, look, it, it, it won't glue together. He said, Abba, but you have this great glue, what we call in Hebrew, Devek Shalosh Niot, super glue, okay? We have, use this super glue. Use it for my uh, shoe that just opened not long ago. I said, right, for the shoe, it's good. For the uh, car, it's not. And why? I told them when you have, I'll just put this down for a moment, when you have uh, a large, um, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, I need to use my hands, right? If you have a large uh, ear of contact, contact between the two, so you put the glue and it goes together. But if it's like his car that he had the seal, what do you call the seal? Axle. The axle and the wheel, it's so small it won't glue together. Um, now, that's what I told him then. He cried, so I put the glue, it helped for another few minutes, and then it broke, and that was over. Um, put aside the trauma of my son, I think this is true for life. Meaning when we want v'dabek libeinu b'mitzvotecha, or when we have the mitzvah l'duvka bo, to stick to God, to stick our souls to the mitzvot, in order for them to stick together, to glue together, we need a uh, very large uh, contact area. And that means that learning Tanakh, or in general learning the Mudei Kodesh, dealing with education, 
dealing with the identity of our students, they need a very large contact area between them and the Torah, between them and mitzvot, between them and Gemara, no matter what it is, in order to really build a strong Jewish identity. And I think that this issue of a strong Jewish identity is crucial for Chutz Laaretz, it's crucial also here in Israel as well. Although here we don't have the chashash, the pachad of assimilation as you have it in Chutz Laaretz, but it's the same issue. And when I talk about a, uh, a, a, a very large contact area, uh, I want to talk about something that Rav Soloveitchik uh, says. Here I'm quoting someone from the United States. Um, Rav Soloveitchik says the following thing, which I think is amazing. You can read it in English. Now, I want to use the Hebrew and go step by step from the third line back up. In English, it's set a bit different. Chokhmat Rosh and Chokhmat Alev. What he claims is, first of all, we have Chokhmat Rosh and Chokhmat Lev. These are two parts of us. Okay, uh, the heart wisdom, the wisdom of the heart, and the wisdom of the head. Second thing he says is, Chavru Yachad. They need to join together. They need to merge. If they don't merge, but sometimes I use Chokhmat Rosh, and in other situations in life, I use Chokhmat Alev, it's wrong. They should merge. The third thing he says, this is Tselem Elokim. The image of God that we all received when we were created is something which combines together Chokhmat Rosh and Chokhmat Alev. Now, this is not just a big, great idea. This has to do directly with what happens in class, in our classrooms. In our classroom, we use a lot of Chokhmat Rosh to translate or to understand the text. We use Chokhmat Rosh to analyze the text. Uh, but we need to use Chokhmat HaLev together with Chokhmat HaRosh. That is a much broader way to stick things together. It's a, 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 it's a larger contact area between the student and the Tanakh. Now, when I talk about that, I want to use a psychological theory of multiple intelligences. I'm sure you're all aware of it in one way or another. And this idea of uh, m multiple uh, intelligences I think is amazing relating to teaching. Meaning, if I go into class and say, I'm using the, uh, things a bit moved to the I see, uh, the verbal linguistic uh, intelligence, okay, that we need it for Tanakh. We also need our logical uh, intelligence for learning Tanakh. If we are in Israel, we'll go out and take a tiyul and use our visual or spatial uh, intelligence as well. If we use a map in the United States, it also has to do with uh, the space the, uh, 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 of the, the map. What about the musical intelligence? What about Tnu'ati, uh, the, the, the uh, cognistic? What about Bain Ishi and Toch Ishi, okay? The in, interpersonal and in, inter, interpersonal. What about them? Are they part of learning Torah? Or those are things we use in other areas of life? Adam Hashalim Lomet Torah. The full man should learn Torah. Full man means the man that has all of these things. And I think one of the, our big advantages is how do we connect our students to the Torah through the Adam Hashalim, the, the, the full student, the full uh, um, uh, student who's in front of us. Now, here I want to touch on a, 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 another thing that really relates to this. I think that identif identification shapes identity. And we're, we all deal with Jewish identity. If I ad identify with someone or something, it will, five minutes, okay? It will uh, shape my identity. And I want to divide it to three things. It's a question of identifying with a figure, with an event, or with a value. I'll begin with an, an event. Leil Hasedo. What is Leila Seder? We try to identify with Sipur Yetziat Mitzrayim. So every year, we have this great event at home with family, with friends, that we try to identify with something that happened thousands of years ago. Um, and uh, trying to identify with that is in order to do something to our identity. 
when we deal with f figures in Tanakh, it's not just a question of who did what and where, but the question is, who is this figure? Wh who is he? Not only what did he do? And if I try to identify with him, I create a friend. I create someone that is part of me. There's the famous story of Rav Salovechik dealing with figures, not from Tanakh, but the Rambam. When he talks about, as a child, he's, he tells the story from the perspective of himself as a child. And he, say, he talks about how amazing this figure of the Rambam was within his house. His feeling was that the Rambam is a friend of his father. And when, they, when his father taught to a Gemara and there was a kushia against the Rambam, this young little kid was afraid. Who will help the Rambam? The Rambam needs help. There's a great kushia against him. And when someone solved the problem, he ran to his mother and said, Mommy, Mommy, you know, the Rambam is okay now. The, the kushia is solved. And when there was no answer, he describes it as a personal crisis of a child that a good friend of his father is in trouble and no one can help him. And what did his mother say? His mother said, you, you will help him. Right? So that's identifying with a figure. Uh, th I think that with the figures of Tanakh, it's much easier to identify with w than with the Rambam or uh, other figures of Torah Shebaal Peh, which it's not stories about them, unless you live in the Slovakic family, so that's part of your life. But otherwise, for most of the people, it's not a story, but it's a figure which is far away. But figures of Tanakh have to have a story, and if we turn the figure into someone who has a personality, that's part of Tanakh. It's not that we need to do it. We just need to define it. We talk about Avraham, Achnasat Orchim. Uh, that's, that, that does it. Second, and third thing is the value. If we talk about values, this is better for a bit older children. Values, if I identify with a value, I want to be part of that value. I want that to be part of what my life is. So, um, uh, th th that's an another uh, uh, thing that has to do with uh, shaping identity. I'll r run far ahead. Uh, to a few, a few sentences which are here together. Some of them we mentioned, some we didn't, and I'll just say something shortly about them. We spoke about Chochmat Rosh and Chochmat Alev. I think that's something very, very basic to be aware of and to expand that into the different intelligences. Uh, seven, eight, nine uh, different uh, psychologists define them in different ways. But oh, being aware of Chochmat Rosh Chochmat Alev, that will help us uh, find a much broader uh, contact area between the students and the Torah. An another thing is Yeda Matzmiya Chinuch, knowledge generates uh, um, education. We need to put them together. Uh, Rabbi Barry mentioned the school should feel Tanakh, right? You, you, you will, we, not only in the classroom, but we should feel it all over. So in class, it's the Yeda, it's the knowledge. Outside, it's, uh, it, it, we feel Tanakh as well. It, it clearly helps a lot. Talich Pnimi or Talich Rikshi an internal or emotional process. I think that's something crucial for us to be aware of when our student goes through something that touches him deeper in, which is, uh, it can be something emotional. Uh, that kind of a process makes a major change, okay? When you had the Tanakh CUM last week here in Israel, I'm sure it wasn't just, now I know Tanakh better, but in addition to knowing Tanakh better, the f internal feeling of, I was there, I saw the place, or the way you described your son, saying, wow, it really happened, that's not just here, it's here in the heart, feeling it really happened. Um, and we spoke about his dahut, Matzevet Zehut, about identification shaping uh, identity, and I think that's one of our major goals in education in general, and in education abroad, where the, uh, 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 the, the danger of uh, a child finishing 12 years in a Jewish day school, but not really feeling that the Torah is part of his identity, uh, it, it, the, the, the fear of Nisoi Tarov at the winter marriage is terrible, and of just assimilating and disappearing uh, somewhere. Uh, he's alive, his children are going to be alive, but is he really connected to Torah, or is Torah something that, okay, I took it in school, but who cares about it? It's somewhere in the past. So that
Um, on a, on uh, on a theoretical plane, uh, I'd like to give an opportunity to everyone to respond to each other, but I have the sense that I haven't let anyone talk, and that pedagogically is a really, really bad thing to do, and I haven't given people the opportunity to ask questions. So well, I'm going to turn it over to the, uh, we have about 15 minutes, I'm going to turn it over to you, and then hopefully it'll also be a, an opportunity to last five minutes to, uh, for people to uh, uh, wrap up with, uh, with a closing statement. So Mark. Uh, d direct it to one of the, to one of the, or to everyone. To everyone. Um, it wasn't until late in my life when, when my learning was very, and when I was young, my learning was meant to be mainly about what I was into about religion. And as I got older, I realized the learning point out is not only about religion, about Judaism, but it's about the Jewish nation. And I feel like that's something that gets lost when we teach children. Something, if you, if you find that there's, there's, we should put a relevance about Jewish nation, not only Israel nation, but Am Yisrael that doesn't live out of Israel, that lives in the Galut. So, so the question is, um, beyond uh, like text study about Yahadut, is there some but sense of nationhood? Even in the reading of the text. Do we, do we find, do we find the concept? It's a more nationalistic approach. It's not only, it's more relevant. It's not only about spirituality, which I know a lot of educators are trying to inspire the children, but it's also having our Jewish nation could be a very inspiring tool. I just didn't hear much about that, so I don't know what you thought about that. Okay. Barry? Um. So I'll, uh, I'll actually borrow a little bit from research that's been done in the last uh, couple of years on Hebrew language learning, uh, done by Alex Pomsen and uh, some of his colleagues. The assumption had been that we need to teach kids Hebrew in order to have them connect to Israel. And that was one of the major forces in Hebrew language learning around the world. If we teach them Hebrew, they'll come. They'll be able to order falafel in Hebrew. Um, and this will make them feel connected to Israel. In a national study that was done both in the U.S. and in a number of other English-speaking countries in the U.K., in Australia, um, what they found was actually the opposite is true. Today's typical student doesn't connect to he Israel because they learn Hebrew. They would like to learn Hebrew once they feel connected and identified with Israel. And so Israel trips and other Israel education leads to Hebrew learning. And I think you can create a parallel from there to propose something similar in terms of Tanakh. If we're able to help kids connect to the broader idea of the Jewish people, and Tanakh is the story of the Jewish people, right? The Breshit is the many attempts to create this and ultimately the Jewish nation starts to emerge and they're part of that, then it's their story. Um, but I think, again, it has to be very much teaching that and experiencing that rather than teaching about it. We don't want to teach about the Jewish people through Tanakh. We want to teach Tanakh in a way that it makes our students feel part of the Jewish people and that becomes an added motivation and catalyst for them wanting to learn Tanakh and connect with Tanakh. Uh, I'll just uh, add one thing having to do with that. I think that the Tanakh is a national story, and it should be learned as a national story, but it's also a very personal story. Uh, dealing with persons there, and dealing with myself as studying it. And I think that we m must touch the personal aspect of my relationship to the people of Tanakh, we are in a very individual world. People are very focused on themselves and on their relationships. Uh, and that's something we need to deal with. And I really agree that we should not talk about it, but we should feel it. We should be part of it. And I think the big advantage is how do I feel as someone who learns Tanakh that I'm part of the story, that that story from ancient times has to do with me today. Ruben? is how much we can turn the Jewish family into a center of identification and learning with Torah. Uh, and how we can create even sometimes very simple uh, tools that can help do it. I'll give one simple example. Uh, now in, in Gush Etzion, we, are, uh, we run a, uh, during the summer months, a Chidon um, Tanakh um, uh, for 
kids in elementary school, fourth to seventh grade. Uh, every summer, they learn a different sefer. This is the seventh year. Uh, we're now learning sefer shoftim. 400 and kids uh, sign up. Every single day, they do a chidon of six simple questions on a peric. And uh, we find that the, uh, the different parents take the, uh, the uh, desire of the kid to win his five knisot to the brecha uh, and turn it into a learning experience that they say is more valuable than what they can learn with the kids all year round. They, and every year they come back and they learn another safer and they say, thank God you've, uh, you've helped us. Uh, so today in Kfar Etzion, they're taking uh, all of the kids who are learning to Shimshon. We're going to uh, uh, the area of... Uh, uh, Shimshon and the sea, uh, Kever uh, Manoach Aviv. Uh, <laughs> uh, which is not it, but okay. Uh, so, the, so the question is how to work, how to work the family into, into the educational process? Yes. Okay. Dita? So, one of, one of the words my children hated growing up was teachable moment. Because everything was, Ima always had a teachable moment. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, is that this, this is true for anything, not not only Tanakh, when, when children see what is valued and is the topic of discussion at home, that becomes something that they value and they discuss. If a child comes home, and I thank God, we're done with parasha sheets in my house. My baby's 28 years old. But you know, when they come home with that parasha sheet and the father rolls his eyes, and the mother says, we heard that one last year. Doesn't your Rebbe have anything new to write? Then, then that sends a certain message to the students, which fairly or unfairly places the onus upon us as teachers not only to engage the child during the six to eight hours that we have in the classroom, but speaking to the, what I spoke about before, to engage the family and to make it real for the family as well. And by the way, as much as the kids hate doing homework, when you give them homework and say, your mom will help you with it, that's not a teachable moment because mom hates doing homework too. So what can I do to engage the family in what it is that I'm teaching? In my ideal world, I would bring families on Tanakh trips every year. This year we're learning Sefer Shoftim. We're going to go to the... It's not going to happen. People have to make a living. There, there, are, there are other children that are not learning Sefer Shoftim. But we need to think about how can we engage the family and not make, unfortunately, many parents feel that their children's homework is a punishment for the parents. And not make that... That's not the teachable moment. But how do we engage and bring those parents in into that circle, whether it's physically into the school or at least into the mindset of these are things that are important that we want to teach. Got it. Baba. Okay, so what, what the past last week, the trip showed me what okay. what so, so Gita said, I, well, I, haven't, I haven't been fair. Um, among, among you um, are about uh, close to 20 members of uh, Gita's Allegra Franco College cohort. cohort, which is the partnership with Herzog that I mentioned um, earlier. Uh, so the, that, that group had a week of Siurim Tanakh Bayad as an introduction to the Yemei Iyun that we are all participating in now. Yes, so go ahead, Baba. So it showed me, first of all, that when uh, I am not working enough, on did it really happened, and where did it happen? So I definitely have to, to work more on that. But my, my biggest challenge is how to, to bridge the gap between the spoken language and the biblical language. Mm -hmm. OK. That is my biggest so challenge. So Gita raised that issue earlier. Um, I without think that an Barry, answer. without an answer, Barry responded on some level. Anyone else want to say something about if we Tanachit, if we Modernit? I think we'll have to. Albert has a question or has a response? Okay, so Bob, I think we're going to have to leave that one. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yes, Albert. Um, So the question is, um, uh, given, given that uh, 
Torah values are not always politically correct. How can we uh, present them? But I think it's more than politically correct. I think children, are, I teach in a high school, yes. in a high school, they have a genuine foundation of belief. It's not about being politically okay. correct. We genuinely can't identify with these biblical values. Okay. So, so the question is, uh, students can't have trouble identifying biblical values. How might we respond to that? I happen to like apologetics personally. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm in favor of apologetics. Because you grew up with um, a Jewish mother. I'll, I'll, mention, I'll mention in passing that our last speaker today um, actually is going to represent Lev Ladat, which is a program that deals with uh, trying to accomplish some of that hafnama, some of that uh, um, values education, although that doesn't respond specifically to your question. It doesn't respond to the question of how do you deal with when, when, when the values are, uh, are in conflict. So, Barry? So again, this is another easy one. Um, there's, no, there's no answer to when the values are in conflict, uh, but I think a lot of what we can do for our students is role modeling what it means to wrestle with them. Um, you know, the, the perspective often in biblical values, first of all, we're looking at the 5% where there's conflict when there's 95% that do work very nicely and that naturally, intuitively make sense. Um, often what happens in our classrooms is we ignore those 95%, we don't talk about them, and then you get commanded to kill Yitzchak or kill Amalek, and now all of biblical values are different than our modern values. Well, no, 95% are the same. Um, and I think there's a basis to that, but again, there's a difference in moral education and value education in teaching the content of a value and teaching how to think, how to gain the perspective, how to act in a way that, embol em uh, that emblemizes or that, uh, that really enacts that value. Um, and I think that the whole idea of value education is something that we can bring a, a much greater deal of complexity to. And if we can do that around the 95% when we agree, then when our students hit Amalek, they come there saying, wait a second, the biblical value system shares a lot of ground with my value system. I identify with it. I can understand it. It's helped me engage in many questions and conversations. Now I have the one exception, and let's wrestle with that exception. Let's acknowledge that it may be an exception where our modern Western intuition differs from what God commanded in Tanakh. And that's okay, but that's a very different message if you have the first 95% that they've really internalized. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask, I apologize to people who still have questions. Um, I'm going to ask everyone for just a, like a two-minute sum up. Then afterwards, we will dave mincha. Ilan? Yesh cheder b'chutz sh'afshar li t'palom l'cha? Tibzok? We'll dave mincha, and then we'll reconvene in about uh, 25 minutes after, after class over, not after mincha. So we'll start again with Gita, we'll go through everyone, um, and I'll say a closing word. Okay. Um, so I'm the problem presenter, so I don't... <laughs> Okay, we solved all the problem now. But it's just really, I think that this, this discussion is an important discussion to continue to have amongst ourselves as well as with others, um, identifying what we see as challenges and trying to brainstorm to discover not necessarily total solutions, but at least partial solutions for those challenges. I've been teaching for a very, very long time. When I started teaching, the biggest issue was people Xeroxing each other's notes. Like that was data, you know, the stealing or whatever we want to call it. it, it things change, the issues change, um, the, the, I think the need for Jewish identity has gone through periods of flux where there were times where people were very, very proud to identify as Jewish, thinking back after Mechemet Sheshet Hayamim, Somebody say you don't look old enough to remember Muhammad. Okay. After that, people were so proud. They would walk over to my father or my brother in his kippah and say, I'm Jewish also. That was a high point. Then there's a low point. Then there's a high point. And we need to be aware that what's going on in the in the rest of the world definitely impacts on our students' desire for connection, on our students' desire for for guidance. When things go well, Kids don't say, why are things happening? And you're religious, so you've got to tell me. When things don't go well, that's when they have that. So it is a challenge. My bracha to you is that you have the 
the, the nachat ruach and the ability to answer the challenge or at least help them deal with it. Um, so, you know, I'll close just with the note that I think that, as I mentioned at the beginning of, of my first remarks, the most important thing that we can bring to any of these challenges is explicit reflection and deep thought about the challenges. As education goes, um, it's not a hard science and there are no clear answers. There are theories that some researchers suggest, others reject, and it's been notoriously difficult to measure and really prove what works or what doesn't work. But what we do know is that educators who are thoughtful and reflective and teach in a thoughtful and reflective manner and understand that the medium is the message. What's going on in their classroom is more educative than what comes out of their mouth. Those educators have students that tend to follow similar paths. Um, and my, my real impression from watching just a little bit of this is that this gathering, this entire experience is about that. Um, and really just want to end with a shokoach to everyone who's participating for not only having dedicated their lives to Jewish education, but putting in the additional effort above and beyond that to try and take it to a more effective and more heartfelt, more meaningful level by pushing themselves in their own development. Um, <clears throat> first of all, for me, from, from my personal perspective, it was amazing to go back 20 years ago and think about uh, education in the United States. Um, I want to say one thing about, the, uh, about value education, which I think is the major issue that can really connect people to Torah. Uh, if we deal with value education, we deal with Tanakh again and again, and we deal it not only logically, but also emotionally. If I ask, a, if I have a discussion in class, a discussion is something which is more logical, it can also be a bit emotional. But if I ask a question to one of my students, who is the figure in Tanakh that you identify with? What does he represent for you? Why do you identify with him? This is not just a logical question, it has to do with something very personal for the student. Those type of questions uh, create a relationship between him and the Tanakh. It's not just knowledge of Tanakh, it's a relationship. Creating a relationship can really uh, leave something uh, strong with him from the Tanakh experience and something that can really, uh, uh, he can take with him for life. Uh, I hope uh, that this visit in Israel is something that you can take with you for life and for your big mission of education in the Gula. Uh, thank you. Um, like everything else we've done today, this is not, the point of this wasn't so much to come out with the answers as much to start, as to start a conversation and to introduce the people on the panel um, and uh, so that you can approach them both now and I'm sure um, in other settings uh, through the various means of communication that exist today in order to follow up with these kind, kind of conversations.